So without further ado, let's uh, wrap up our series, Numa. Uh, but before that, we'll just pray really quickly here. Father God, we just thank you and praise you for this time to get into the word, Lord. We ask that your word speak to us today, Father God, because we know that your word is anointed. It is alive and powerful. It's not a message of man, Father God, but it is the word of the almighty God. So we thank you for it today, Father. We ready our hearts to receive your word, that our hearts would be good soil for your word to take root and to produce a hundredfold crop in our life, Lord, because we don't want to leave anything on the table that you have in store for us. We thank you and we praise you, Father God, for these things today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So this is our final week of our series, NUMA. Okay? It was a very long series, but it's a very necessary series in the body of Christ because, unfortunately, a lot of churches, uh, I can't say a lot of churches, I'm guessing, let's just put it that way. The churches I've been to previously don't teach on these things, don't talk about these things because a lot of people don't understand these things. But what's the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1? Don't be ignorant. We're not even going to really go to that verse because everybody knows it. If you don't know that, it says don't be ignorant about these spiritual things because what happens when we're ignorant of them, we stay away from them. And uh, Chris just, he said it perfectly about that supply train, right? This is a vision I had gotten, must have been back in February, thank you for writing down the date, Chris, <laughs> uh, of a train, we, of a locomotive, but it wasn't, and it was a, it, the train was the church but the difference was the train wasn't a passenger train like we think of it to be. Like, toot, toot, yay, we're all going to heaven. Let's hop on the, the train and ride together. It wasn't that. It was a freight train with delivering things where it went. Okay, so that was the church, and that's really how the church is supposed to operate. The church is a freight train. We have a supply that that world needs, and it's us to, up to us to go and deliver the things and that's why the Apostle Paul said, don't be ignorant of these things, because if you're ignorant of them, guess what? The Spirit can't operate, and then you're depriving the world out there of what God wants to give them. So that's why he says, don't be ignorant of these things, right? Now, what are these things? Well, verse 4, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, we've got the diversity, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. So God's conducting. He's the train conductor, right? He's, it's all God. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Right. Not just the profit of believers, the profit of everyone, the profit of all. Verse 8, for to one is given, these are the nine gifts of the Spirit here. We got the word of wisdom through the same Spirit, or through the Spirit, excuse me. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. So there's nine gifts in all. Verse 11. But one in the same spirit, once again, the same conductor, works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now, last week, we looked at different kinds of tongues, okay? Um, and it's going to tie in a lot to this week. So if you missed last week, go on YouTube. You can find the video there. It all, it's all going to tie in. But we really focus on the private or the devotional aspect of the gift of tongues. This week, we're going to tie in the public aspect of the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. So we're going to wrap it all up nice and neatly here. Now, the question is, and this is where a lot of people get confused, can tongues be used in public? Well, let's go over to Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 through 18 here. And this is where we uh, talked about how, what Jesus said about tongues. So let's go Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 16, my apologies. Mark 16, 17, and 18. This is Jesus speaking, and he says here, In these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, like I said, this is where Jesus said, these signs will follow those that believe. You've got to believe in his name, and you also have to believe in the signs that will follow. Okay, otherwise they're not going to operate. Now, he says they're going to cast out demons. Okay, well... That can be done privately. That can also be done publicly. 
We just got to be careful how we handle it in public, but it can be done publicly if it needs to be done. Another thing he says in there is, as they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We have healing services. That's a very public aspect of laying on hands sick, right? So if those two can be done publicly, I guess the other ones can be done publicly as well, right? Why would there be any differentiation between the gifts? It's, Jesus doesn't like speak in riddles. He speaks in parables, but they're so you can, they can be revealed. So we can see that if... Uh, laying on of hands can be done publicly. Casting out demons can be done publicly. Tongues can be done publicly. Okay? So we're just settling on that. And that's what Jesus said here. It's not what the Apostle Paul said. But we're really going to dive into what the Apostle Paul said on this. So let's go over to 1 Corinthians 14. And we're pretty much going to stay there almost the entire service. Uh, because it's just the, it lays out everything in regards to tongues and prophecy. Uh, so let's see. 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to start here in verse... So this is the difference here. We're going to see a clear difference between private or devotional aspect of tongues, public aspect of tongues. Verse 2 says, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. We talked about that last week. That's one of the huge important parts of praying in tongues is you're speaking mysteries to God. Verse 3, But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So really, you can almost break it down like this. Every time the Apostle Paul says tongues in these few scriptures, he's talking about the private aspect of it. And every time he's talking about prophecies, he's talking about the public aspect of tongues. Because if you remember, we talked about tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy. And you can see that very clearly. Look at this in in verse 5. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless, indeed, he interprets that the church may receive edification. So you got to remember this. If you get anything, it's this. Tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy. Prophecy is a greater gift because you don't need two gifts to operate to get the one. But tongues, you need interpretation with it to get to prophecy, okay? So... In these, we can see the differences because when it says tongues, it's talking about prayer language because it talks about he's talking to God, he's not talking to men, he's edifying himself. But when he's talking about prophecies, he's talking about edification to the church, okay? That's the difference. It's the direction in which it's going, okay? Very simple. Private aspect of tongues, person to God, edifying themselves personally. Public aspect, it's going to the church. It's, not ed- it's, ta- it's speaking with God, but it's to edify everybody, not just the one person. So... It is through our prayer language or private use of tongues that we communicate with God and we build ourselves up. And this is an aspect where it can be appropriate for all of us to do that in church. For instance, if we're all worshiping and praising God and, you know, Missy's leading worship, Pastor Josh, whomever's up here leading worship, and we're praying in tongues individually as a body, like we're just worshiping God together, that's totally fine. There's, that's not out of order in any way. Because remember, last week we talked about one of the aspects of tongues is magnifying God. Okay, so that's not out of order. It can become out of order once worship stops. So if I were sitting here in the front row, praying in tongues, worshiping God in tongues, and worship is over, and I'm still continuing to do that, I'm out of order. Okay, because that's now a distraction for everybody else, because I'm just standing there edifying myself, magnifying God, and everyone else is like, what in the world is he doing? This guy's nuts. So then it's out of order. So we can see these gifts have an order to them, okay? Now, it is through tongues and interpretation that we edify, exhort, and comfort the entire church. That's what he was saying in verse 5. Who you prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues unless he interprets that the church may be edified. Everything we do on a Sunday morning, really anytime we come together, is for edification of the church. That's what preaching is. That's what teaching is. It's to build you up. It's to to comfort you, to exhort you. Um, And that's what the gifts are going to do too. They're going to edify the church. So... 1 Corinthians uh, 14, let's go to 18 and 19 here. Let's see. The Apostle Paul said here, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So Paul here is not belittling tongues. Because right in verse 18, he says, I thank God I speak tongues more than you all. 
which is kind of a boastful thing, but whatever. Uh, the Apostle Paul, can, you got to read it. He can be a little rough and sharp at times. And you're like, man, I kind of like him, actually. The more, the more you read him, like, I really like Paul. He's really bold in this stuff. Uh, but he's not belittling tongues, okay? He's just saying it's more beneficial for the church that I speak in my own understanding because it's going to benefit you all as opposed to me coming up here and praying in tongues. Because we would leave the service, I'd be feeling great, and you guys be feeling confused and going, what in the world just happened? I didn't get anything from that. So this is why the interpretation of tongues comes into play. That's the gift we're going to dive into here. So if you're taking notes, interpretation of tongues can be defined as this. The supernatural interpretation or meaning of a gift of tongues by the Holy Spirit given through a person. Okay, It captures the meaning of the tongue that was spoken. So really the purpose is, is to supply an intelligible message to an unintelligible tongue, okay? Because remember, it says if he speaks in a tongue, no one understands him. Now, there can be instances where you're actually speaking a different language and someone in the congregation might know that language and can understand exactly what you're saying. We saw that in Acts chapter 2, right? When they were speaking, speaking uh, and the people said, we can hear him in our own native tongue, and they're, they're uh, praising God and giving their, what does it say? They're talking about the wonderful works of God. So there can be instances where that happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. But usually, when a tongue is given, it's not understood by everybody here. That's why the interpretation is needed. So, interpretation of tongues is the least of all the gifts of, tongue, or of the Holy Spirit because it's dependent upon another one. Does that make sense? Yeah. You don't have interpretation of tongues without tongues. I mean, this was kind of the funniest one to prep for me because interpretation of tongues kind of tells you what the gift is just in the name of the gift. Right? So I was like, how am I going to do 25, 30 minutes on interpretation of tongues? But okay, uh, so this is how it works. Let's just get into it here. Uh, a person who operates in the gift of tongues should seek the interpretation. The Apostle Paul told this. Look at you in 1 Corinthians 14 already. Verse 13 says, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So we should pray that we interpret our tongues, okay? Now, this can be used in your private prayer life. It is not just necessarily a public aspect. All of these gifts are not just necessarily in public, but we're focusing on that right here. Privately, though, you can interpret your own tongue. You can pray that you interpret, but it's not necessary, all right? Because in verse 2, we saw, he says, if I pray in a tongue, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. All right? So if I know I'm speaking directly to God, speaking mysteries, that should settle it for me. I don't necessarily need to know what I'm praying about because I know it's by the Spirit directly to God. That should settle it. God knows exactly what I'm saying, and that's all I need to know because it's not about me necessarily understanding it. But if I am graced to understand it by the power of the Holy Spirit, praise be to God. That's awesome too because what really happens is it kind of, I, I think it was Pastor Steve, it says it's like, it's like your mind bypass prayer in a weird way. You pray directly from your spirit. You bypass your mind. So, Because what happens in our mind is it's like a filter. Your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions, almost like a filter. You're going to filter everything through your soul. I don't care who you are. Your life experience and stuff, it all is in your soul. Okay, That's where your, remem your, your memory is and all that. So you're going to filter everything, every word through that. This bypasses that filter and goes directly to God. Because what happens is when we pray in our own understanding, we pray through that filter or through the lens we look through life through. So if I'm going to pray in my understanding all the time, I'm only going to pray through the window I view life through. Now, if I'm praying in tongues, I'm bypassing that window, and I'm praying through the window that God sees through, which is a way bigger window than I'm ever going to see through ever in my entire existence, okay? And what happens is when I pray through in my own understanding, I'm limited, and then when I pray in the Holy Ghost, I'm not limited. I, you're unlimited prayer at that point. Because if you started realizing everything you prayed in tongues, I bet you wouldn't pray what you're praying sometimes. Because most of the time, you're probably praying about yourself. And you're probably praying, God, help me to die to myself. Help me to surrender myself greater. Nobody would write. You really don't pray those, in all honesty. We pray selfish prayers, let's be honest. That's the bottom line. We pray, we pray prayers in our understanding that are selfish because that's what we see. I don't see what other people see. I see what I see. So if I'm praying for my understanding, I'm praying for my viewpoint. But if I'm praying in tongues, I could be praying for, I could be interceding for somebody else. I could be praying literally from their viewpoint. So it opens it all up. And that's the important part of it. 
okay? So we don't necessarily need to understand everything we're praying about. We just got to settle. If the word says God hears us, that's it. I don't care anymore. I don't need to understand it. I don't need to figure it out. God just said, do it. I'm going to do it. Okay? Pastor Chris said this, uh, and I love this story. He said the one time he was just praying, and God, <laughs> God came up to him and said to him, uh, not come up to him and said to him, but just God spoke to him and said, you know what your problem is? And <laughs> Pastor Chris was like, oh, this should be a good day. <laughs> What's my problem, God? He goes, you try to understand everything. He's like, I didn't ask you to understand. I just told you to do it. God wants obedience. Okay? He wants obedience. That's what it was from the garden. All he said was, like, don't eat from that tree. And uh, side note on this, my wife was studying this this week, and it was really good because when the enemy came up to Eve, he said to her, is it true that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve said to him this. She said, no, he told us not to eat from that tree. In fact, he told us not to even touch that. God didn't say that. He didn't say don't touch it. He said don't eat it. So where did Eve get that from? Was that from, did Adam tell Eve, hey, also don't touch that thing? Because now Adam added to God's words, okay? And God says, don't add to my words, just take it for what it is. Don't add to it. Or did she exaggerate? Because now what happened was, I didn't even see this, when the enemy gave her the fruit, guess what? She thought in her head, don't even touch that or I'm going to die. As soon as that fruit entered in her hand, now she's deceived because she had a misinterpretation of what God had spoken because now the fruit's in her hand and she's still alive, so, wow, if I can touch this and not die, I bet I can eat it too. Takes a bite. God didn't say that. He just said, don't eat the fruit. Just stick to my words. Don't add to them. Don't subtract from them. Just do what I told you to do, and it's going to go easy for you. So a lot of times we get all fixed, it, and we're trying to figure things out because our brain is a tool, and it wants to solve problems. And if your brain doesn't have a problem to solve, guess what? It'll create a problem to solve, and then you sit there, and you meditate on it over and over. And that's why God said, don't do that. Just do what I told you to do. Obedience is great. Following instruction is wonderful. I'm telling you, you don't have to figure anything out. It's the easiest thing ever. You just go, what do you want me to do, God? And he says this, and I go, okay, I'll just do that. It's simple. It, really, and live your life that way. Instruction is key. Read throughout Proverbs. Instruction will take you to other levels you could never get to on your own because it's required. You, you need to follow people. That's why you come in here. That's why you listen to whoever's preaching this word because you need to follow the instruction because otherwise we get in trying to figure it out on our own and we misinterpret things or whatever. No, we just got to take the word for what it says. So I don't even remember where I got off on this. Anyways, <laughs> so interpretation. Okay, here's the difference. The interpretation of tongues is not a translation of tongues. I've gotten hung up on this many times for a while where I'm thinking, okay, God, I need to know exactly what the words I'm saying are meaning, but it's not that. Because an interpretation is, or excuse me, a, in a translation in its exact rendering, and my tablet just shut off, great, praise God. So an interpretation is different from a translation because a translation is a word-for-word -word grammatical ex, uh, translation of whatever was just said in tongues. An interpretation, however, is a meaning, the general meaning of what's being said. So think about it like this. It's more thought by thought instead of word by word. Does that make sense? You're getting the general meaning of what God's explaining to you. It's not necessarily, these are the exact words that he's saying, okay? Because I used to get so hung up on that, and then I realized I've been interpreting my, tongue, my prayers and tongues all the time without even realizing I was doing it. Because I would just get, like, I'd be praying in, in the Spirit, and I'm praying, and I would just see something. That's how our mind works. We don't see words. We see pictures, right? And I would see kind of what I was praying about. And then afterwards, I realized what I was praying about. And when I started to see it, I would start praying in my understanding and then interpreting what I was praying. And that's really all it is. It's not super complicated. I used to get all hung up like, oh, I got to know. What, am I speaking uh, Swahili or what am I doing here? Like it, and it's not that. It's way simpler than that. It's just you understand what you're talking about. You understand what you're praying about in that situation. So it is not, like I said, a translation, it is an interpretation. Thought by thought instead of word by word. That'll set a lot of people free. It set me free. It really did. So, the gift of interpretation of tongues, now, it is required in the public aspect of the gift of tongues. All right? 1 Corinthians uh, 14, verses 2 through 5 says this, and we've, we just read it. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. 
I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in a tongue, once again, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So if tongues are happening in the public setting, like from here, from the platform, it needs to be interpreted because it needs to benefit the church. That's the bottom line. And what happens is, if when it's not, it causes confusion in the body, okay? There are situations, however, where the private aspect of tongues in public is okay. We talked about one of them during praise and worship. Absolutely fine. We're all doing it together corporately, okay? Another situation where it's okay is say I was up here and I needed to edify myself quickly. Now, one little trick that we do, I'll let you guys in on this, I'll let you in the back, you know, behind the curtain here. Uh, if we ever have to do this on stage, you know what we do? Because then it's not recorded on anything because it's not for public use, okay? So we just pull the mic away. Because what happens is we're edifying ourselves. We're building ourselves up. And if we think about it, it's really no different than praying. It'd be no different than me coming up here saying, Father God, I ask for your help. I need you today to speak through me. It's the same thing. It's just you're doing it in tongues. That's the only difference. But people get weirded out because then they jump up and they're like, there's no interpretation on that. It's because it was, act, it was private. It was just happened to be in a public setting for one second. So... Both of those are private or devotional use of tongues. Now, when a tongue is given publicly and not interpreted, it brings confusion to the body. That's what happens. We had many years ago, um, we had a minister come in, and he gave a tongue publicly, and his wife came up and interpreted right afterwards. And guess what? The entire congregation was blessed by that. Even people who didn't understand the gifts of the Spirit in operation were like, wow, that was amazing, because they recognized God in that. But if I just came up and spoke in a tongue publicly and there was no interpretation, people don't recognize God in that at all because there's no order in it. Right, right, right. right? So look at this. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So he's not a God of confusion. In fact, let's skip down to verse 40 here. It says, let all things be done decently and in order. We have to remember this letter was written to the Corinthian church by the Apostle Paul to explain to them how they should be operating in these spiritual gifts. So if it's written to them, it's written to us. Because people, what happens if there's no instruction and there's no order, it's all over the place, and it's crazy, and it's out of control, and that's not what he wanted here. God's, or the Apostle Paul said it needs to be done decently, and it needs to be done in order. Otherwise, it's confusion. Okay? So, great. It needs to be done in order. Well, what's the order? Glad you guys asked that question. It's first, <laughs> go to verse 26, and we're going to see the order here. The Apostle Paul writes, it says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. I love that everybody in the church setting had something to come with. A lot of times we come in here, what's the pastor going to give to me today? No, 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 no. You should be coming in ready to supply whatever you got because we need what you got just as much as you need what we got. Amen? And that's how it works all together. Every joint supplying it's what it has. Verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. There's the order. Okay? Public aspect of tongues should be Two or at the most three people speaking in tongues, each in turn, which means in order, not all at the same time, and then one person should be interpreting, okay? That's the order. So now the person who prays in tongues also can be the one who interprets, but there's only going to be one interpreter for all of them, all right? So at the most, there's three. And actually, if you want to count, remember, tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy, at the most there should be three prophecies or tongues plus interpretation total, okay? Otherwise, we'd be here all day because, remember, he just said, everybody comes in, they all got something, all right? Well, that'd be like one person, two, three, four, five. I mean, there's 55 people in here, and there'd be like, we'd be here till tomorrow. Like, that's not, that's not feasible in a service. So there needs to be order with this thing. Now, the reason he also said to have one person interpret is so we don't get competing interpretations. Because remember, an interpretation is the general idea of what's being spoken in tongues, not the translation. So what happens, and you'll realize this as you start operating in these things, someone may say something in a tongue, or someone may say something, uh, prophecy operates the same way, like I said, because it's all the same rules. But we'll be 
doing praise and worship, and I'll be like, I got something. But then I can know I'm not on the schedule to do prayers and offering or prayer for the city, right? So I will trust God that whoever is do, I'm scheduled to do that will give the same word I was going to give. And guess what? They do. Every time. It's not word for word exactly the same, but the general meaning behind of what I was getting in the spirit will be expressed all across the pulpit. That's how this whole thing works. And that's why when you see, like, next week you're going to see all these students come up, and it's going to be the, kind of the same general idea. They're all going to tie in together because it's, this, remember, the same spirit operating all these gifts together. That's how it works. We overthink these things, and we discount ourselves from it because we think they're too complicated, but they're really not. They're very simple. And you probably do it more than you realize. Being led by faith, you probably do more than you realize, too. It's amazing. You, you really do. We just don't think about it. We don't talk about these things. So, like I said, we don't want competitive interpretations because uh, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul, um, let's see. Let's go back a couple chapters, and I'll tell you if I'm correct or not. Yep. The Apostle Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, you know, they, they were saying, I'm of, uh, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, and there was, there was bringing division into the church. So we don't want division, we want unity and order, because we just saw that God is not the God of confusion, but he's like, let everything be done decently and in order, right? So when we have these things done in order, they operate the way God wants them to operate. And look what happens with this. Go up to, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're going to bump up to verse 22 here. It says this, and this was like, for the longest time, I had such confusion on this passage of Scripture, and you're going to see until in just a minute. Verse 22, therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Okay, so tongues are for unbelievers, prophecy for believers. That's what I got from that verse. 23, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all, he's convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down in his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. And I was like, that's really strange because it's almost like he contradicts himself from verse 22 to verse 23 because he's saying tongues are a sign for unbelievers, prophecy for believers. But then he says in the next verse, if you're all praying in tongues, aren't the unbelievers going to go, you guys are out of your mind? But if you all prophesy, they're going to fall down and worship God? So I had to look up a different translation here, and I'm going to pull it up in the message. This creates a little bit more clarity for me, and I'm going to really explain this, and I think we're going to, we're going to get it. Not even, I don't think we're going to get it. We're going to get it. Verse 22 in the message says this, So where does it get you, all this speaking in tongues no one understands? It doesn't help believers, and it only gives unbelievers something to gawk at. Plain truth speaking, on the other hand, goes straight to the heart of believers and doesn't get in the way of unbelievers. If you come together as a congregation and some unbelieving outsiders walk in on you as you're all praying in tongues, unintelligible to each other and to them, won't they assume you've taken leave of your senses and get out of there as fast as they can? But if some unbelieving outsiders walk in on a service where people are speaking out God's truth, the plain words will bring them up against the truth and probe their hearts. Before you know it, they're going to be on their faces before God, recognizing that God is among you. So what he's saying really is, is if everybody got together and everyone's praying in tongues, it says, it says all of you are praying in tongues, right? It means everybody at the same time, that's the whole service. Somebody who doesn't believe is going to walk in and go, they, those people are nuts. They're crazy. They're speaking gibberish. I don't know. No one even said anything. I don't know what's going on. I'm leaving, right? But when it's done in order with the interpretation, people will recognize order. Because like I said, we had that minister come in, they gave a tongue and his wife gave an interpretation. People who didn't understand the gifts of the Spirit understood that. Because what happens is they, they go, wow, God's truly among them because that was a sign and a wonder that I just saw that somebody just came up, gave something in a tongue I didn't understand, but the other person came up and knew exactly what they said. They'll get that because tongues plus interpretation equals prophecy. So now you can see where the Apostle Paul is saying, if you're prophesying or speaking the truth of God, it will pierce people's hearts. Because when you're interpreting a tongue, that is the truth of God being spoken in a intelligible way. So when we see that, it benefits believers and unbelievers, 
okay? It's not just for the people up on the platform being used in the gift. In fact, it doesn't even matter who is on the platform. If God wants to use somebody else, he's going to use somebody else. And that's the bottom line with all these gifts. It's not ever for the person using the, being used. I can't even say using the gift because it's not theirs. It's, theirs. it's God using them. It's not for their benefit. It's for the benefit of others around them. So basically, you're just a tool in God's hand. That's all it is. That's all. Pastor Chris said it like this. Uh, so you've, if, you're, if you have a sink and there's like a, the drain spout on the bottom, right? Basically, all we are as ministers is that drain spout. The stuff that comes out of it, or the faucet rather, we're the faucet. The water, the glory that comes out is all from God. You ever taken apart a faucet and looked on the inside of that thing? It's got gunk and stuff. It's not the prettiest thing, okay? And that's what it is. We can be gunked up and messed up and stuff like that, but God will still operate because it's him moving and him using these gifts. It's not anything to do with me, Pastor Josh, whomever speaks. We're just being used by God. That's all it is. And you can be used by him too because he doesn't, he's not a respecter of persons, okay? So we see here that even if they don't understand tongues and they're not believers, they can understand the order and operation of God, okay? Because people recognize order. People like order. Whether they say they don't or not, they like it. Trust me. Everybody, anybody in here ever been to Disney World? Disneyland? A couple people? It's pretty orderly. In fact, it's very orderly, okay? But you recognize that because order is almost like, it's like this, this level of excellence. And that's how God wants to operate. God wants to hop every way higher than Disney World operates. They just do it pretty good on a natural level. They're just the example for this. But God, when he's in order and operation, oh my gosh, there's nothing like it. It's pinpoint accuracy every time when he wants to speak something, do something, say something. It's amazing. And that's why we got to get into this. And this is why we got to not let, don't be ignorant of these things, right? Because if we're ignorant, they ain't going to operate. And we're going to be out of order. And we're going to try and figure it out on our own. I don't want to try and figure anything out anymore. I'm done with that. What's it say? Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Praise God. That's what we're going to do from here on out. Yeah. And we're going to see what the Bible says about these things. So look at this. In 1 Corinthians uh, 12, verse 7 here, remember, uh, it says here, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit, the benefit of everybody, believers and unbelievers alike. Because when we operate in these things, everybody's going to benefit. Because God knows the, everybody's heart in here. Amen. So he knows exactly how to operate these things. And the Apostle Paul, in fact, said this in 1 Corinthians. Just go back a couple chapters. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. He says here, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of God. When these spiritual gifts are in operation, it always points people to God. Because you realize those, that person could not have known that. That person could not have known that in any way other than God. And that's what the Apostle Paul says, because he's like, I don't want you to trust in my wise words that I say. I want you to trust in the power and operation of God. Because otherwise, if we don't have these spiritual gifts in operation, we're just talking words of men's wisdom. And that's not what it's about. It's about God himself, the words he spoke. Because otherwise, just like T.L. Osborne said, when he went on his first uh, ev evangelistic trip over into, I believe it was like the Middle East or something, he went over there and he, went over, not being filled with the Holy Spirit, just went over preaching the gospel. There were no signs, there were no wonders, there were nothing like of that sort. And he realized, I can't put my word, the word I believe, this word, the word of God, up against other people's religious words because I'm only speaking words. There's no power back in those things. So now what differentiates my religion from their religion? Nothing, according to them, because there's nothing to show for it. But when you start operating in the power of God, wow, now God's confirming everything you're saying, and now people can, it's undeniable. Okay, it is undeniable when God operates and God wants us to operate in these things because when we don't, what really happens is it grieves the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It grieves the Holy Spirit. Look at this, and this is not in my notes. We're going to go to Mark chapter 3, verse 1. Mark 3, 1, and this is really what I'm going to wrap up with this here. It says, and he, which is Jesus, entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely. They were watching Jesus, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. They were watching to see if he would do something kind of crazy that didn't fit in their little box. Verse 3, 
And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. And he said to them, and he knew he's wa they're watching him. This, I love Jesus' boldness. He says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill it or to kill? But they just kept silent. Look at this at verse 5. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately, look at this, they were rejoicing with God. No, they immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. He didn't fit in their little mold of what they thought God was going to operate in. And Jesus was grieved by that. Because what happens when we come in here with a preconceived notion of how God's going to operate and we shut out the gifts of the Spirit, it grieves the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wants to work. It wants to move. Imagine if Jesus fell in line with their, their, their structure. That man's hand would have never been healed. Because, oh, it's on the Sabbath. We don't do that on the Sabbath. We don't do these tongues things. We don't do that. That passed away with the apostles. That's all done with. No, no, no. We don't do that because the, the word of God is clear about these things. When we operate them, it doesn't, it, now that gives the, free, the Holy Spirit free reign to just flow through people. And not just for the benefit, like I said, of the one that's flowing through, for the benefit of the person it's supposed to go out to. You see the difference? So that's why Jesus was grieved. He looked around because it's the hardness of their hearts. They were so structured that they didn't want this guy to be healed because it was on the Sabbath. They wanted to uphold the Sabbath super high, this religious rule super high, that it was, it was hindering people from receiving what God had from them. We're taking off the limits on this thing. And that's why this whole series was preached, because what happens is, teaches us, we're not going to be ignorant of these things. When the Holy Spirit wants to move, we're going to let him move because we know it's him, because we know his voice and the voice of a stranger we're not going to follow. We know how he speaks to us on the inside because we know the internal witness. We know the living presence of God on the inside of us. So when we know he's going to do something good, we're going to let him do something good. We don't want to hold him back because, oh, it was on a Sunday morning, and that's not how we operate on a Sunday morning. It was on the Sabbath, so we don't do that on the Sabbath. It was, it's a, we, no one's ever done that before, so we don't do that before. Nobody, I, no one in my family's ever spoken with tongues, so I don't do that anymore. Why? Why are we limiting God? Why are we limiting God? It's the same thing, I think it's in Mark chapter 4, um, when, I'm not even going to, uh, no, not Mark chapter 4, I was just going to preach on it. So it's when Jesus is in the house, and uh, every, it says the power of God was there to heal everybody, but no one was being healed. No one was, because no one was tapping into it. It was there, it's present, it's always present. God's presence is always present. He's the omnipresent God. He's here all the time, but we gotta tap into it. But what I love about that story is the house was packed full. Everyone just listened to Jesus. But these four guys climbed up on the roof and tore the roof off the place to drop their friend in so their friend could be healed. And it says Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith by their works of tearing a roof off the place. But really what it is, what I saw in this was it wasn't just a natural roof that they were tearing off. They were tearing off the limitations that these other people put on God because they didn't press into what God was offering. And we're not going to do that. This place from here on out, like you said, Chris said, you can feel it. There's an urgency. There's a, there's a moving forward of what the Spirit's going to do through Love City Church and through us as a congregation. And it's not to glorify Love City Church at all. It's just we're open to what God wants us to do. And we're praying this for other churches because we don't want God being held back because of our religious beliefs and these things that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Because Jesus, last time I checked, broke off every generational curse. And that's the curse of religion. He bound these spirits upon the cross, and they were stayed up there. So we're not going back to that. We're not going back to the cross. We're not going back to the grave. We're going to the right hand of God where Jesus is seated in the right hand of the Father with all authority, all the power and dominion, and that's where we're seated too. And when we start recognizing things, we're going to step out in these things. We're going to step out in boldness, and people's lives are going to be changed because it's not just about God operating. God needs people to operate through. You are the hands and feet of Jesus, and I'm just exhorting you right now to really step out on these things because when when you do, there's other people that are waiting on your obedience. Yes. This is not a game we play, people. This is not just a fun time. We come together on Sunday morning. Oh, praise God. Worship God. This is awesome. I go home with tingles. No, 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 no. You need to get filled up with this, guys. This is a matter of people's eternities out there. We need the spirit in operation because that's going to point people to the truth of God because you're going to operate in things there would be no way you would know. You're going to say things to people there would be no way you would know what's in their heart because the Holy Spirit revealed it to you. 
And when you just trust God, I love this. My friend Gary Barkovich used to say this. When you just walk in in the spirit, you will do things more accidentally in the spirit than you even realize. You'll say stuff and people will be like, how did you know that? You're like, how did you know? How did I know what? Like that it's, it's like, is mind blowing and God is that good. Yes. Praise be to God. I, that, that's the close, I guess. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't know. See, when you just let God operate, he's just going to speak and he's going to move and he's going to do because he's going to benefit everybody here. Everybody here. And I guess really before I close, I do have a word that I got in worship. I don't know if anybody's in here has been struggling with mourning or loss or sadness or grief, depression. But the word says, and we sang it actually, there may be pain in the night, but joy Joy comes in the morning. And I, whoever this is for knows that verse, and they're wondering when the morning's coming. And I want to encourage, this is a word for everybody, but this is, someone specific in here says, yeah, I know that verse, but God, when's the morning coming? I've got a word for you. It says in Revelation that when the new heaven and new earth come and where God dwells, there is no day, there is no night. There's always light. There's no sun, there's no moon because God is the light. There's no night with God. There's only day. There's only morning. Not morning as in crying, but morning as in daylight. So the joy comes when you decide the joy comes. Morning comes when you decide morning comes, okay? Because with God, it's always day. Yeah. It's your choice. Because one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. Yeah. It's not something you have to obtain. A fruit is something that grows naturally. It's already on the inside of you. The seed of joy is on the inside of you, whoever this is for. It's on the inside of you. you got to start walking in it. you got to start tapping into it, okay? Because, like I said, there may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. It's always morning with God. The time of morning is up to you. You're not waiting on God. We're not waiting on God anymore, church. This is the thing we got to get. We're not waiting on God. He already did something on the cross over 2,000 years ago. He said it's finished. Now it's our turn, guys. It's our turn. So we're going to step out and step out into these things, okay? So joy is for you today. It's for everybody today. It's for you right here, right now. No more sorrow. No more grief. No more depression. Choose joy. It's a choice. You choose it. You choose it. Amen?